So here we are in another episode of uh, Immutable Conversations. Uh, we were here last time with Paco and we discussed the future of Aero, a lot about polymorphism and some of the main features of the library. And we are here today with uh, Simon. Uh, he is in charge of the optics library and also he's responsible for a lot of the optimizations of what's coming next on Aero FX in, in the IO monad in, in Aero. So welcome Simon. Thanks. Hello, Errol. So we've been uh, discussing with Paco that a lot of new things came uh, with AeroFX. Can you tell us a little bit more about what AeroFX is, what it's good for, and what it does? Um, <clears throat> AeroFX is um, a set of utilities you can use in functional programming to build uh, concurrent programs. Um, it ex uh, exists of a couple of type classes and an effect type, which we call IO. Um, and we are at the moment working on a new I.O. which has better support for suspension, which is a feature we find in Colin. Awesome. So you mentioned suspension and uh, suspension has been like uh, a great uh, feature for us in, in AeroFX and we've been heavily basing on the development atop the suspension system. So can you tell us a little more about suspension, what it's good for and what users can do with suspension in Kotlin? Okay, so you can use suspension to track side effects, or that is at least what we use it for in Arrow. Um, there's other use cases for suspension, like the Colin X library uses it for a kind of async await syntax. Um, and uh, we have found other use cases for in the past, but we are deprecating them in favor of uh, a newer one that we built. Um, but I think the biggest difference here is that between a regular function and a suspending function, uh, a suspending function cannot be executed um, or invoked without it being in a suspending context. Okay, so that means effectively that users will be able to track side effects if they flag their functions as suspend. Is that correct? That is correct. You can only call another suspending function if the function you're calling it from is also a suspending function. Cool. So in Aero, with that in mind, what we do basically is we use the IO monad or the IO continuation as that uh, context. So basically, we allow suspend the functions to come into the IO context because they are uh, error control and so on. So, but what's the main difference between, for example, programming uh, and tracking effects and just completely ignoring effects? So like, what's the value of actually? Uh, what what do we care about tracking those effects and? Okay, so in a more imperative style programming where you do not track side effects, you need to keep a cognitive load in your mind of where are exceptions occurring, where should I try catch them, um, how should I resolve them, um, should I put this in as a return type because it's checked exception, not having checked exception, those kinds of things. Um, if you do uh, effect tracking, uh, you can effectively forget about that in the user code. Uh, okay because we can do all those things in the effect data type or IO data type because we track the side effects. We know nothing is executed yet, so we are 100% sure no exceptions have occurred, nothing weird has happened, uh, nothing has changed in our environment. Um, so we can effectively take care of all of that in our code so the user doesn't have to worry about it. So essentially, uh, suspended functions or functions that are encapsulated into the IO monad are by definition, peer, right? And, and that allows us to, to think about pieces of our programs in isolation, which respect to the entire uh, system without worries. So essentially brings safety. And um, yeah, that's great. In functional programming, when we are dealing with uh, errors, there is always the question of, uh, for one, we are in the JVM with Kotlin, Scala, and all these languages. And so we are, uh, dealing with throwables uh, and exceptions, and and that is always not the desirable, right? So we always see the question of people trying to represent their error in either the return type or somehow being parametric to the type of the error so that they can express errors in their own hierarchy outside of throwable. So can you tell us a little bit how error effects uh, handles this and what we are gonna be seeing next in terms of error handling? Okay, so currently um, in our I.O. Uh, data type, as we have it now in version 09, um, there's no uh, custom uh, error tracking. So there's no 
uh, way for the user in a very convenient way to track his own custom error domain. Um, we've noticed that there's a lot of people interested in doing this. Um, and we've also seen similar movements in other functional uh, communities like the Scala one. Um, so what we are going to do uh, in the next iteration of I.O. is we're going to make it um, express both the success and the error type. Um, and this way, the user can also track their own er domain errors throughout their program. So essentially, a user will be able to either raise an error that comes from the throwable hierarchies, like, th like they're doing today, raising exceptions in the context of I.O., or they will be able to say, this program is failing because of this custom error, which I've created myself, which is not a throwable, and that is still sort circuits and obeys the same principles. Yeah. That's good. Um, so one thing, like you've already mentioned, is we have to deal with throwables and exceptions on the JVM. Um, so even in a situation where you're tracking your own custom errors, we still have to deal with that. Um, so uh, some of the operators will include a mapping from throwable to your custom error type. And there's also a global error handler uh, that you need to uh, provide when you want to run your whole program. So how does this work, really? Because uh in most uh, error handling scenarios, like what people would be familiar with is try-catch, which is, you know, supported by the language, but there's challenges with try-catch when we are doing async jumps and then kind of like moving programs, programs from one thread to another. How does error effects, uh, you know, deal with this kind of a situation since it's a concurrency and async framework? Um, because uh, we take care of running all the code, we can take this into account. Um, and the biggest challenge there is that no matter where you are on the GVM, an exception can occur, right? Um, so, and if the user is tracking their own errors already, we need to be able to map somewhere from an unexpected thing happening on the JVM to their domain. Uh, so they need to take this into account whenever they are trying to execute certain uh, side effecting functions or they're trying to run the whole program. Is that like done through bracketing or some other kind of like system that okay. supports? Um, so there are a couple of operators that you can use to deal with the resource safety. Uh, this is special functionality that we build into the system. Uh, for example, um, you know, acquiring a resource uh, that cannot be canceled. Uh, if an exception occurs, the program needs to be finished. If the resource was acquired, then we need to call some release function depending on the result of using that resource and all those kinds of things. And even more complex scenarios where you have to acquire a couple of resources, use them in sequence, and close them in the correct order. Those are all use cases that we can build on top of our I.O., build on top of our effect system, and provide these utilities already implemented for the user. So they don't ha have to deal with any of this. So one of the biggest areas uh, that Simon has also been helping with is the optics uh, library. Uh, optics, uh, as you see them today in Arrow, were actually uh, called optical, if I'm not mistaken That's before. That's correct. And, uh, Simon created a great optics library that eventually became part of Aero. So can you tell us a little bit about you know, optics in general, what they're good for, and also how are they implemented in Aero, and how can users take advantage of this great feature? Um, OK, so um, optics, Aero optics, or originally optical, uh, is a library to um, update, modify, and query uh, deeply nested data structures. Um, actually, originally the project started for me as a case study because I wanted to study uh, optics, how they work, what they're useful for. Um, and very quickly I learned that for very complex scenarios like doing things with JSON, uh, where things can be recursively nested or just very deeply nested stuff, if you want to work with them and update them, uh, it's very annoying, becomes very boilerplate-y, uh, it's not very composable or re reusable or not, even not at all. Uh, and optics uh, uh, solves this problem okay. completely. That's great. So when you say uh, deeply nested data structures, uh, can you give us an example? Are we talking about actual collections or actual you know, user models that people create, like you know, the typical person, business address, zip code, kind of yeah. nesting? What are we um, looking at here? So the most typical example of optics would be a lens. Okay. Uh, and a lens basically is uh, an abstraction to look from a type inside. So for example, that could be to look inside a person and figure out his name. Okay. Right. Um, 
but these things compose. So we could have uh, a company which has a list of employees and the list of employees, they have a family and the family lives in an address. And, you know, there's a lot of things that you need to traverse. Let's say that one of your employees moves and right. you need to change the address. You don't want to go inside this and inside there. Uh, because that becomes very annoying, especially with immutable data structure. We have to we keep using copy, nested copies, nested right. copies. So that becomes that a pyramid of yes, nested. That comes a, becomes a pyramid of nested uh, structures uh, and methods. And that becomes very annoying. And it's not reusable at all because all that nesting, you have to write it every time you have to do something similar. Um, instead, if you can compose these little pieces that look inside, then you can create a usable or reusable piece of uh, logic that just looks inside its structure. You can use to update it, query it, modify, it, you know, whatever you want. And that gives you back a, a new immutable data structure. That's great. So how, from the point of view of a user, like say I have this already defined a uh, complex uh, model, what kind of boilerplate or what kind of code uh, does Arrow expect me to add on top of my SEAL classes and my data classes? in order for uh, you know, take it, uh, taking advantage of all the benefits of this API or, or lenses? Okay, so in Aero Optics, there's a couple of very powerful things to do. So there's a core, uh, which exists of the different kind of optics, um, but there is also a meta compiler or code generator, whatever you want to call it, that generates on the border plate for you. Okay. So besides adding the annotation, there's really nothing for you to do. Uh, and on top of generating all the optics, it also creates a DSL uh, where you don't have to deal with any of the internals of optics. You don't have to know anything about them. Uh, basically, what you can just do is a sort of dot style, uh, JSON syntax, DSL, uh, to create your queries. So like in the model we were discussing, there would be something like person, dot, address, dot, whatever. And exactly. so the place we want to modify. Exactly. Right? You can just chain all those properties like you would uh, read the value from it. And you can use that. Um, that chain to update, uh, or that's actually the optic, and you can use that optic to chain, uh, compose with other optics, you can use it to update uh, and modify the data structures. What about like, uh, what if my purpose are collections or, you know, other more complex data types than just like basic properties? How is that like playing to the whole DSL or how do I uh, update those? So we already talked about lenses, which you can use for data classes. Mm -hmm. um, a similar concept uh, exists for seal classes, which we call prisms. Mm -hmm. um, a very long story short, you can use a prism to see which case of your seal class that were actually found at runtime. Um, for lists and collection, there exists a similar thing, which we call traversal. Uh, and the traversal basically can point to multiple nodes as one. So if you have a company with multiple employees, and you want to retrieve all the addresses, you can say, I want to look at all the employees of the company. And for all the employees, I want to be able to see all the addresses, right? So you can, uh, you can chain these different style optics with different powers uh, to compose a, a very strong optic. So we've been having a, a lot of comments uh, from users regarding difficulties uh, in, in terms of imports in the ways uh, type classes export their extension functions. They end up... Uh, exporting them at the top level. So now you people get, when they want to import FX, they get a million suggestions <laughs> from IntelliJ as to which one to pick. So we are actually gonna, uh, we find a way to, to solve that problem. And uh, Simon and I have been working on that with Paco and, and Jorge and some of other members of the community, trying to come up with the best way uh, to do that. So do you mind telling us, Simon, with, uh, what we're thinking and how we're gonna solve this issue? Okay, so currently, like you already said, the issue is that there's too many extension functions mm -hmm. uh, on a global level. So all these extension functions are top level functions. So IntelliJ tries to make the best suggestion, which is all mm -hmm. the top level functions there, uh, but that's really heavy uh, on IntelliJ. Uh, so that really slows uh, the experience of the user down. Uh, so one thing that we can do there is um, make them available on the concrete types. So mm -hmm. they appear as instance methods. This is uh, much more lightweight for IntelliJ uh, to resolve these methods. Um, for things that remain top level package, like uh, racing, uh, parallel mapping, those kinds of uh, 
functions, we're going to make them available on the companion objects, which will also make it all, a lot more lightweight uh, for IntelliJ to resolve them, but it will also make it more uh, easier for the user to find them because right. they will always be in the same spot, which is the companion object, which is probably also where most people will start looking for right, them. Exactly. Um, and then a third trick, which I actually found very neat and uh, didn't realize before we started experimenting with this, uh, is if you want to make a bunch of uh, extension functions available without uh, creating that load on IntelliJ, you can actually do that with receiver functions. So if you have a function that takes a receiver lambda, then it's much more lightweight for IntelliJ to resolve those functions because he, he can find them on the receiver as instance methods. So yeah, essentially with this new uh, scheme or organization, what we're going to accomplish is for people that use concrete data types or they're programming directly with I.O. or either or whatever, they will have all the methods of the API that Aero provides immediately available uh, over the instance or the companion. And if you are programming with polymorphic uh, functions, then uh, those methods will be implicitly available because uh, the type class has them yes. in, in its receiver. And that basically eliminates uh, most imports, if not all, for, for all error functionality, yes. which is pretty cool. So this should remove all imports besides the actual data types and the type classes. That's great. All right, thanks, uh, Simon, for coming and telling us all about error effects and all the cool things that are coming up. Uh, I want to encourage everyone watching this video uh, to come and join us in the Kotlin Slack. We have the Aero and the Aero Contributors uh, channel. We're a friendly and inclusive uh, community, so please uh, drop by and feel free to ask any questions regardless uh, of level. Uh, we welcome your contributions. Thanks for watching.